particular on Exodus and Deuteronomy, employing a variety of methodological approaches. His numerous contributions examine issues relating to reduction, reception, the Near Eastern cultural context, and the relevance of trauma theory. His recent volumes include The Decalogue and Its Cultural Influence, and a co-edited volume, The Fall of Jerusalem and the Rise of the Torah. Today, he's going to speak um, about his finding the people in the assembly, Kahal of Israel, the politics of inclusion and, and exclusion in Deuteronomy. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, thank you very much indeed, Kapel, for your kind invitation and to the keep for wonderful organization. I look very much forward to meeting people during the conference. Ladies and gentlemen, as a Roman Catholic and Jesuit, priest from Austria, who has found his first love and profession in the Hebrew Bible, I feel like a half-convert to Judaism. So I'm very honored to share with you some thoughts on the Torah and specifically Deuteronomy and how they relate to the issue of conversion. The title of our conference presupposes the convert as people who associate themselves with a religiously defined group. By way of adopting this group's religious uh, professional of faith and practice. In Judaism, we do not know of any evidence of such uh, push reality before the Hellenistic period when non ethnic Jews are to associate themselves with Judaism. I should say from the outset, therefore, that I will not directly address converts in the sense of conferences title, but I will ask. Uh, how this later phenomenon relates to the self-image of the people of God as it is presented in the Pentateuch, and whether the later stages of the Pentateuch composition may have opened doors to allow for the idea of conversion. Moreover, the title's uh, reference to status implies that conversion is not just the individual process, but that it leads to a new social situation for conversion. This invites consideration of the issue in a wider framework of sociological theory about inclusion and exclusion, which will be my first point. I shall then look at the construction of Israel's ethnic identity in the Pentateuch before turning to criteria for religious exclusion and inclusion in Deuteronomy. In this background, I shall evaluate how Deuteronomy could open a door towards the possibility of conversion to Judaism. In an attempt to develop a general model uh, of the construction of collective identity, Schmuel, Noah Eisenstadt, and Bernard Giesen proposed to distinguish what they called three major codes of the construction of collective identity. Namely, first, primordiality, which refers to gender and generation, kinship, ethnicity, and race. Second, the civic code, which refers to familiarity with implicit rules of conduct traditions and social routines, and third, what they call the cultural code in a specific sense, that is, relating the collectivity to an unchanging and eternal realm of the sacred and the sublime, uh, be it defined as God or reason, progress or rationality. Eisenstadt and Giesen's theory also involves the concept of latency. Like religion, they claim, I quote, Collective identity can also fulfill its function only if the social processes constructing it are kept latent. Attempts to question it and to lift the veil of latency are usually rejected by pointing to its naturalness, sacredness, and self-evidence." End quote. I shall return to this concept of latency. If we consider the Pentateuch as a foundational myth that aims to construct a collective identity for an implicit audience that identifies with Israel in the Pentateuch's narrated world, we can straightforwardly discover the three codes described by Eisenstadt and Giesen. The first relates to how the Pentateuch describes the people of Israel as the descendants of the family of Jacob, Israel. The second relates to the Pentateuch's implicit and explicit claims concerning right Israelite behavior, as opposed to the ways of the Canaanites or nations. And the third refers to the portrayal of Israel as the people of God and related rules of behavior. The three codes are related to each other in complex ways, 
And together, they provide an ideal image of the collective identity of Israel that is, historically speaking, the emerging Judaism or Judaisms. In what follows, I shall turn to some ethnic and religious aspects of how this identity is formed, since the relationship between ethnic and religious aspects is decisive for the question whether conversion to Judaism can be considered a viable possibility. The, net, uh, the patriarchal narratives of Genesis provide the prehistory of Israel's foundation myth, while Exodus to Deuteronomy concerned the foundational story of Israel as a people. By Yamat Yosef, Vakol Echav, Vakol Hador Hu, Bene Yisrael, Baru, Veshatu, Veyerbu, Veyatsum, Im Od Maot, Timale Haaretz Otam. Thus, within a single verse, the family of the Bene Yisrael have become a large crowd, and they have also been called a people for the first time in the opening words of the Pharaoh who did not know Joseph. The genealogical details of how the Bene Yisrael became a large people are not given. The decisive criterion of their collective identity seems to be that they all are descendants of Jacob Israel. How many women and men from other groups did they marry to avoid inbreeding? Were those spouses Egyptians or from other groups? Questions such as these that might add unwelcome complication to the gene genealogical theory of ethnic identity are not addressed here. The Israelites' collective identity and unambiguous distinction from the Egyptians is presupposed by the narrator as well as by Pharaoh. The designation Bene Yisrael repetitively reaffirms the ethnic theory of the people's common ancestor no less than 343 times in Exodus to Deuteronomy. The lack of any reference to marriage across diverse groups in the original growth of the Israelites as a people could be understood in terms of latency, according to Eisenstadt and Giesen. There are, however, a few passages in the Pentateuch that seem to complicate the genealogical theory of Israel's primordial, primordial ethnic identity. The first of these passages is found at the decisive moment of the Exodus, when the Israelites are about to leave Egypt and thus dissociate from the Egyptians physically and geographically, a separation that is emphasized by the motif of the crossing of the sea. The verse of interest to us is Exodus 12:38, which the Septuagint translates Kai Epimiktos Polis. The King James Version has, and a mixed multitude went up also with them. Even as I identifies this mixed multitude, as Nahum Sarna notes, with the Asaf Suf in Numbers 11.4. Septuagint and the King James Version also create a link with Exodus 12.38 through the parallel translational choice, Epimictus, and mixed multitude, respectively. King James has, and a mixed multitude, a multitude that was among them fell lusting, and the children of Israel also wept again and said, who shall give us flesh to eat? Both passages seem to suggest that along with the Israelites, other people participated in the Exodus and the wilderness wandering. Deuteronomy 29.10 also suggests ethnic diversity within Israel. There, Moses lists all those who are present for the making of the Moab covenant, and he includes Gercha Asher Bekerev Machanecha, your alien who is in the midst of your camp. This Katel may be questioning a little bit uh, your aspect about the land, but let's discuss later. In this context, but of course, right later. Um, in this context, where all Israel is in un, uh, uh, united in a single camp, the term ger seems to refer to non-Israelites in ethnic terms, just as the Israelites had been gerim in Egypt. Since gerim stand together officially with the Israelites upon entrance into the Moab covenant, 
it clearly seems that they are supposed to belong to the people of God that is constituted through the covenant. In addition, Deuteronomy 23 seems to allow for inclusion of certain non-Israelite groups into the assembly of Adonai, the Kahal Adonai. While Ammonites and Moabites should never be admitted, lo tetaev adomi ki achichahu, lo tetaev mitri ki ger hayit abemit be'artzom. You shall not abhor the Edomite, for he is your brother. You shall not abhor the Egyptian, because you were an alien in his land. The children of the third generation that are born to them may be admitted to the assembly of Adonai. Shall be admitted. Should be admitted. Since this passage does not explicitly refer to mixed marriages, it seems to be applicable to descendants of Edomites and Egyptians, even if they have not intermarried with Israelites. This, in turn, suggests that certain people who are clearly genealogically non-Israelites are to be admitted to the Kahal Adonai after two generations of cultural assimilation. It is noteworthy, moreover, that the reasons given for the inclusion of Edomites and Egyptians are quite distinct. Why the Edomites are acceptable because of a close kinship relation with Israel, expressed with the term your brother, the Egyptians are acceptable for the historical reason of having been hosts of Israel. I shall try to evaluate uh, the issue of Israel's primordial or ethnic identity in the Pentateuch. Although the Pentateuch presents the collective identity of Israel as ethnically and genealogically grounded in a common descent from the family of Jacob Israel, several passages complicate this claim. Some passages suggest that non-Israelites accompanied the people at the Exodus and in the wilderness. Deuteronomy 29 suggests that such people were included in the Moab covenant. If this is the case, the Israel that is constituted through the covenant with God is not strictly defined by genealogical ethnicity, notwithstanding the persistent emphasis on the concept Bene Israel. This tension between diverse conceptions of the collective identity of Israel in the Pentateuch invites critical reflection on their likely diverse origins in different sources and redactions. It is significant, however, that the redacted form of the Pentateuch integrates passages that advocate for a conception of Israel that is not strictly defined by the idea of genealogical ethnicity. This suggests that the editors of the Pentateuch were aware of the sociological complexity of ethnic identity, which in natural non-isolated societies is never constituted by genealogically pure ethnicity, but is rather a social construction. The political consequences of this, however, are significant. If the narrative of Israel's origin in the Pentateuch admits that pure primordial genealogical ethnicity did not exist at the moment of the Exodus, nor when the Moab covenant uh, was concluded, how should genealogical purity serve as a strict criterion to demarcate the boundaries of Israel in any future situation? The Pentateuch thus opens doors to complicating the seem seemingly unquestionable naturalness of primordial inclusion or exclusion by lifting the veil of latency. I shall now turn to my third point, religious criteria of exclusion uh, and inclusion in Deuteronomy. According to Deuteronomy's conception, Moses' audience in Moab are the descendants of the generation who witnessed the, the theophany at Mount Horeb who were des uh, destined to, to die in the desert because of their disobedience in Kadesh Barnea. In addition, Deuteronomy 4.3 notes that Adonai, your God, destroyed from among you everyone who followed Baal Peor. In other words, the worship of another deity led to exclusion by death. In a similar line, Deuteronomy 13 requires the death penalty for any person, even the clo of closest relations who might try to seduce another Israelite to worship another deity than Adonai. This extreme precaution against disloyalty has a structural similarity with the succession treaty of Esarhaddon from 672 BCE that requires loyalty to the Assyrian king and his designated crown, a successor to the throne, Ashurbanipal, and imposes the death penalty 
for anyone who instigates disloyalty. Bernard Levinson and Eckhart Otto, among others, have argued that, that Deuteronomy 13 is inspired by this neo-Assyrian context. Signific significantly, however, the biblical text transfers the requirement of loyalty to the religious realm. Seduction to other gods amounts to high treason, which requires the death penalty. This implies that the Israelites are defined as worshippers of Adonai and as non-worshippers of other gods. Deuteronomy 13.6 uses, for the first time in the book, the formula, Ubi arta hara mikirbecha, you shall purge the evil from your midst. A circumscription of the death penalty as a means of ex exclusion. Deuteronomy employed the same formula in several other laws that are thus termed the arta laws and frequently considered characteristic of the older pre-exilic material of Deuteronomy. Ruth Ebach pointed out that the concept of the midst Kareb in the Biarta laws is interesting in terms of Eisenstadt and Giesen's theory, according to which the center is a focus of identity. The criterion of exclusion is expressed by the uh, ethnical term evil, hara, which could be attributed to Eisenstadt and Giesen's civic code, the second of the three. In the wider context of Deuteronomy, the civic dimension is integrated into the religious realm, since the laws are understood as grounded in divine authority. Moses teaches what he was commanded by God himself at Mount Horeb. Besides these dra dra draconic laws of internal exclusion, Deuteronomy notoriously demands strict external exclusion of the Canaanite nations, which is expressed by the prohibition of intermarriage with them and even the command annihilation, the concept of harem. The reasons given for this exclusion are predominantly religious, the danger of seduction to worshiping other gods in Deuteronomy 7, and of learning illegitimate, illegitimate rites, such as child sacrifice in Deuteronomy 12 and 18. While several texts that potentially date back to the pre-exilic period formulate criteria for exclusion from Israel based on religious grounds, in the redacted version of Deuteronomy, this appears just as the reverse side of the coin. Its positive front side is the religious construction of Israel's collective identity, especially through the concept of the covenant, which brings me to the fourth point of my paper. In Deuteronomy, Moses communicates two covenants to Israel, the first is the Horeb covenant that Moses declares valid for the moral generation in Deuteronomy 2 to, uh, 5, 2 to 3. The second covenant is conventionally called Moab covenant according to its introduction by the voice of the narrator in Deuteronomy 28.69. This is the introduction to the discourse of chapters 29 to 30, at least in the redacted form of the text. The Moab Covenant Discourse in Deuteronomy 29 to 30 has some conventional elements, such as a historical prologue and the declaration of the presence of the assembly that is to enter the covenant quoted already, but it also contains unusual elements, especially a long prophetic digression at the center of the discourse. There, Moses warns Israel of the terrible consequences that a false covenant oath would entail. Israel would be thrown off their land. Moreover, Moses anticipates a future in which all these words will come upon you, the blessing and the curse that I have led before you. Then, when Israel be, be, will be dispersed among the nations, God will gather them again and bring them back to the land. This passage, Deuteronomy 31 to 10, is constructed around the light word Shuv, to return. The agents are both Israel and God, here indicated in blue and red. Israel will return to Adonai, and God will bring Israel back to the promised land and restore its fortunes. 
At the center of the passage stands the prominent metaphor of the circumcision of the heart. God himself will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants so that you will love Adonai your God with all your heart and with all your soul. God himself enables Israel to love God and therefore to obey his commandments as verse seven adds. Against this background, the chapter culminates in its final section in the command to make a choice between life and death, which also means to, to, uh, the choice to enter the Moab covenant in verse 19. The scenario that uh, the voice of Moses unfolds clearly refers to the post-exilic return to Yehud in the Persian period. And the text is therefore dated not before the early Persian period by most scholars. Important for our topic is that this text bases the collect collective identity of Israel upon a religious commitment worded in a highly personalized and interiorized language which is typical of the period, as Moshe Weinfeld pointed out in his article, Jeremiah and the Spiritual Metamorphosis of Israel. In other words, when Israel is to return from dispersion into the promised land, the people must take a personal religious decision so that you may live in the land that Adonai swore to give to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, thus the final words of Moses' discourse. Without the commitment to loving God and obeying his Torah, Israel would suffer the same fate of death that previous generations had faced at the hands of the Assyrians and the Babylonians. An additional aspect of the return to God that Deuteronomy envisions for the exiles is developed in another, in another passage in which Moses presents a prophecy of exile, namely in Deuteronomy 4, 25 to 31. There, Moses anticipates that idolatry will cause the loss of the land and moreover, that the exiles will, I quote, serve other gods made by human hands, objects of wood and stone that neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell, verse 28. In this situation of suffering, the exiles will search and find Adonai, they will return to him and obey his voice. This scenario involves more than just renewed commitment to worshiping Adonai. It means a radical change of religious practice and commitment from idolatry to the true religion of the God of Israel. This scene is as close as we come to the idea of religious conversion in Deuteronomy. While the exiles are supposed to have primordial ties with Israel, they are in need of conversion to worship uh, Adonai in order to become part of the Israel of post-exilic restoration. In other words, Deuteronomy 4 imagines post-exilic Israel as a people of converts, or to employ another set of anachronistic terms as apostates who repent and return to their God. Both texts, Deuteronomy 4 and Deuteronomy 30, suggest that the redacted form of Deuteronomy formulates against the background of the traumatic destruction and loss of the homeland, a program of post-exilic restoration of the collective identity of Israel that is based on individual and collective religious commitment to Adonai and his Torah. The religious dimension of Israel's collective identity is thus emphasized more strongly than ever before. I shall now evaluate the potential implications of this analysis for the prehistory of the idea of religious conversion. Several passages in the Pentateuch complicate the primordial or genealogical definition of Israel's identity by mentioning other groups who left Egypt together with the Israelites. Deuteronomy 29 even suggests that, suggests that Gerim entered the Moab covenant and Deuteronomy 23 allows for the integration of third generation Edomites and Egyptians into the assembly of Adonai. The late redactional history of Deuteronomy reflects the dramatic events of the sixth century BCE, when destruction and deportation by the Babylonians forced Judeans to engage with foreign religious practice, especially in Babylonia and in Egypt. The carrier group behind Deuteronomy attests 
to the attempt to promote a collective identity for Israel that advocates the return to the promised land and relates it to Israel's post-exilic identity in both individual and collective religious commitment to Adonai and his Torah. The doors that the Pentateuch leaves open for the integration of genealogically non-Israelites and a strong emphasis on religious commitment or the construction of post-exilic collective identity leaves some room for the idea that persons who are associated with Israel and display a clear religious commitment to Adonai and his Torah could potentially be considered part of the Kahal Adonai, eventually even of Kol Yisrael. In this sense, Deuteronomy's vision of post-exilic Israel as a people of converts in inverted commas may allow for the idea of conversion to Judaism, a phenomenon attested in later sources. Thank you very much for your attention. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I, I'll try to uh, respond in, in uh, general and theoretical terms. Um, I think we, we have faced a very, of course, always uh, methodolog methodological uh, complications or uh, difficulties as we are on the one hand looking at texts that uh, present a ideal image of collective identity. And we need to ask ourselves, how does this relate to the historical reality behind the text uh, and the context uh, when they emerge? And um, so um, it's very much understandable that the, the texts would create an ideal image of collective identity uh, as uh, in terms of ethnic uh, purity, as a genealogical purity, which is a phenomenon, of course, not uh, uh, specific uh, just for biblically Israel, but uh, is found in many cultures, uh, conceptions like these. And of course, we know uh, from sociological um, research that this is generally more a construction than reflecting historical reality. Um, now, it's easy to understand why the text would present uh, an ideal image. It's less easy to understand why um, why it would introduce foreign elements or admit for that. And uh, at least for, so I, I agree with you that uh, the passages in Deuteronomy in Exodus 12 and the numbers uh, 11 are difficult to interpret, but um, at least for uh, uh, Deuteronomy 29, I find it very curious why the Gerim are mentioned explicitly in the making of the, of the covenant, which is a legal act here really. And, uh, and also, of course, there's a dispute as to how Gerim should be uh, understood uh, in then other legal texts. But here, the text clearly adopts the vision of the narrated world, that is, uh, it's the Mahane uh, uh, in Moab. And therefore, there is basically no other option than to uh, understand them as non-ethnic uh, uh, Israelites. Um, and then uh, if the covenant means a religious um, constitution, as it were, of uh, uh, the people of Israel as a people of God, that uh, strongly suggests to me that, um, uh, that the Gerim really take part of this, uh, or part of this collective, and let's imagine their descendants are probably quite naturally integrated. So, um, at least there, I, I see quite a quite a strong uh, reason to interpret uh, or allow for an interpretation that um, somehow complicates a purely genealogical um, understanding uh, of the collective as of Israel.
First of all, I would like to thank very much the uh, organizer of this uh, conference. I would like to apologize because unlike the original uh, schedule, uh, the new schedule is conflicting my teaching in Tel Aviv. So I'm teaching today at four o'clock in Tel Aviv and I'm teaching tomorrow at 10 o'clock in the morning in Tel Aviv. So I will not be able to stay. And even more, this week is the week of the Board of Trustees. And as, and as you know very well, this is a busy time and I'm still hoping to be at 3.30 in a meeting with a very important donator for my excavations. So uh, I'm really apologize that I will not be able to stay further more. I want to clarify uh, one thing before I'm starting to um, present my lecture because I will present a little bit different uh, point of views than uh, these that were presented before now. Uh, according to my view, during most of the uh, biblical period, uh, there was no question in Judah who is a Judahite and who is not. Anyone who was in the borders of the kingdom of Judah was a Judahite, even if his name was Aravna the Jebusite, Uriah the Hittite, or Itai the Gittite. So there was no question who is a Judahite, and even a woman. Uh, could be, for example, the wife of Uriah the Hittite and then marry David and be the mother of Solomon. And no one asked if Solomon is a Jew or not, if Bathsheba, who's married to Uriah the Hittite, is a Jew or not. People lived in Judah and they were Judahite. And this is why I'm using all the time when I'm talking in, on the, in the first temple and very also in the early second temple period about Judahites and not Jews. I think that it was a long process and very late since people started to think about who is who to include and who is who to exclude. And I think that it was a long process that began sometime in the Persian period and continued in the Hellenistic period, as I will try to uh, demonstrate in my lecture. And the first question was not who to include, but who to exclude. And I think that one of the first question that arises this question was the question of foreign women. So um, this is why I chose as the subject of my lecture today to ask since when and by whom this uh, question started. And uh, this would be the main uh, question. One more thing, I wrote many new small paper on many different subjects. And what I wanna tell you is that when you're talking about Persian period Yehud, Judah, we are talking about few dozen priests living in very small Jerusalem. Uh, and like good uh, Judeans, fighting one the other through the text. Polemics, Midrash are not a new thing uh, uh, that, you know, uh, uh, characterize new uh, Judaism or new uh, Jewish way of thought, life and fight. But it was also part of the daily life in Persian period Judah. So many things that became later essential, many things that became big, started in small fights between families of priests and others. And I will try to summarize it later. So even if the question is big, the subject is big, the answer at the end will be very small. So well, don't be disappointed when we finish with it. In the coming moments, I would like to demonstrate that during most of the history of the writing and editing, women played a very marginal role in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. Judean women were mentioned in the book only as part of a very wide generalization. However, foreign women that were mentioned in only two very focused units in the book, which are late ideological additions were used as part of a new layer that was added to the text with a new ideology and polemic originated in a defined group in Judah in Jerusalem, directed against another defined group in Jerusalem as a very defined, in a very defined time in the history of Judah. These women were used by scribes and editors, but it didn't change much of the reality and ways of life among Judeans in Judah 
in Babylonia or in Egypt, and perhaps even expressed the position of a very small group that, want, that went against the practice prevalent in the centuries before and in the same period, even the extent of influence of this new ideology on the practice that prevailed in Judaism in the following decades, maybe more than decades, is not really clear. But what is clear is that other opinions and voices continue to be present in Jerusalem in the same time and can be seen through the other books like Ruth, Chronicles, the Priestly Laws, and in large part of the biblical historiography, including Israel and Chemaya, some of it can be dated earlier than passages dealing with poor and women in Israel and Chemaya, and some are later. So basically there were two lines of thought and two lines of expressing idea through the text. Let's start. The marginal place of Judean women in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah um, is very clear. Judean women uh, were mentioned only seven times in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. In all of these occasions, they were mentioned as part of a very wide generalization aimed towards a definition of a very large assembly, men, women, and children. Beside once in the book of Ezra, all the other six uh, uh, occasions of mentioning women in uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, in Nehemiah are usually in plural. Only once in Nehemiah 8, verse 2, there is a different way of generalization in singular, literally translated as from men to women. But this is the same use, and probably it's a kind of a game and was probably changed in order to give variety to literary generalization, since in the next verse, in Nehemiah 8.3, there is a use of more, a more common pattern of mentioning men and women in plural. Moving to Judean uh, daughters, and uh, Judean and foreign daughters in Israel Nehemiah, there are few places in Nehemiah when the term daughters, but not, was used similarly to Judean women as part of the wider generalization of the Judean community. However, in a, in a, a more polemic and ideological part in Ezra and Nehemiah, especially in Ezra 9, in Nehemiah 10 and 13, there is a different use of the term daughters. And in uh, this instance, it has been used with a different purpose than the term foreign women that I will explain in a minute, and with different verbs that were connected to the daughters, uh, mainly to take, to give, or to marry. The connection of these verses to Deuteronomy 7, verse 3, is clear. And the danger of religious deviation from the right path is defined as the main reason for warning from marriage to foreign daughters or giving Judean daughters to foreigners. One should consider the suggestion that Deuteronomy 7, verses 3 and 4, are, uh, as well as the later additions in Ezra and Nehemiah that I will show in a minute, connecting to foreign women are an attempt to, concede, to constitute an explicit exegetical development of Deuteronomy 23 uh, and 2 to 9, applying now the Torah against Ammonites and Moabites to all, quoting, when they heard the laws, they excluded all foreigners from Israel. In the older text, um, those uh, is a very differentiation between Ammonites and Moabites and other Edomites and Egypt, uh, Egyptian, as we saw before. And there is a kind of definition, but in my opinion, these texts concerning the daughters are part of the older and original text in Israel and Chemiah in the spirit of Deuteronomistic circles in the early Persian period and the source for the later development of the idea of generalization, generalization of foreign women or foreign daughters in Ezra 10 and in Nehemiah 13, as will be discussed below. Daughters always appear in plural, 
as the literary use of the word is akin to commerce with the understanding of give and take and uh, even the treatment of marriages is within the semantic understanding of giving or taking possession over the women. The two rival circles in these cases are within the Judean people. I'm talking about the Holy Seed on the one hand and the people of the land, Amaretz, on the other. And the message is that there is a gap between these two circles of Judean people in Judah. This gap, as well as the two rival groups, the Holy Seed and the people of the land, in Zerah Kodesh, the Amaretz characterizes the beginning of the Persian period and the gap between the Gola community and its representatives in Jerusalem and the Judeans who remained in Judah during the exile and has an expression in the formation process of the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. This part of the book is inseparable from the ideas that exist uh, in it at this time specific time of the early Middle Persian period, and it uh, uh, precedes the later developments that also includes the idea of the prohibition of foreign women. Now, if you are coming to foreign women, so foreign women are only mentioned in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah in two uh, especially distinctive parts of the book. In Ezra 9, in Ezra 10, is part of the unit of Ezra 9.10, when Ezra 10 is probably a later, it's, it's well known, a probably later expansion of Ezra 9. And in Nehemiah 13, verses 23 to 27, which is a very small, limited, and exceptional addition to Nehemiah's prayer in Nehemiah 13, verses 14 to 31. All in all, Foreign women appear 13 times in these two distinctive parts of Ezra and Nehemiah and in nowhere else in this book, only here. The appearance of foreign women in these two units in Ezra and Nehemiah with no other parallel in other parts of the book is a clear indication that it is a late ideological addition in the spirit of Deuteronomy 7 intended to expand and emphasize the scene of giving and taking daughters as wives interpreted as a, theologic, a theological scene and warn people of the future not to continue with their deeds in the present. So they know that in the present we have foreign. In the future, don't do it anymore. Foreign women, this is the, the, the best picture I find for foreign women. Meaning, yeah, yeah, meaning women originally from families outside of the borders of Judah. This is the definition of foreign. We're probably pre present in Judah as well as in the Babylonian Gula. We know very well that in the Babylonian Gula, women. In the Persian period, as it was before, but to see it as a religious and ethnic problem was probably a new concern that developed among certain circles in Judah during the Persian period, maybe even late, as I will try to show later, probably in the later part of this period and found its place in these two additions and distinctive parts in Ezra and Nehemiah. The main claim of these two late additions to the book of Ezra and Nehemiah against, uh, not restart now, I think, okay, Again, the foreign women is very different from that of taking and giving daughters and no longer focused on the issue of mixing the holy seed with the people of the land that appeared in earlier parts in Israel and Nehemiah and probably bothered circles in Jerusalem already in the early Persian period. When moving to foreign women, the problem is always with taking wives, never giving, and with the source of these women situated outside of the local circles of Israelites with no sign for an inner conflict between the Holy Seed and the people of the land. So now we have all Israelites united against foreigners. This is not only a clear development of the earlier concept, 
but it expands in uh, uh, expanded from an inner conflict between the returnees from Babylon and the Judeans who didn't go to exile to the outer circle, Judeans as a whole and foreigners who are not Judeans. Ezra 9 is part of the original source of Ezra and Nehemiah, what we call Ezra's prayer, likely edited in the early fourth century BCE. It doesn't mention the foreign wives at all, but does emphasize the problem of taking and giving daughters as part of the problem when the holy seed is mixed with the people of the land. In this slide, I see the story of Ezra 10, 7 to 44, as a later addition to Ezra 9, while uh, Ezra 10, 2 to 6, served as a literary connection between these two units that was added as part of the final editing of the book, which, as will be explained below, probably occurred during the early Hellenistic period. I will go to, for the Ptolemaic period and I will explain it in a few minutes. Also, Nehemiah 13, 23 to 27, the only part in Nehemiah memoirs that mention foreign women appears to be a late insertion into the final prayer of Nehemiah. Only in Nehemiah 13, 23, is there a clear specification about who these foreign women are. Ashdodites, Ammonites, and Moabites, and probably Ashdodites is original, and Ammonites and Moabites were later added in light of Deuteronomy, and with an, an attempt to expand the text according to the Deuteronomistic law. In any case, only the Ashdodites are mentioned in this text in verse 25, and probably verse 24b was added in order to match the addition of verse 23 when they mentioned the Ashdodite, only the Ashdodite, but they added the Ammonites and the Moabite, and because only the Ashdodite language is appear in verse 25, and then they added in order to have Ukilshon Am the Am, the according to languages of each people. So two generalization were added here. This part of the text uh, is also the only place in Israel Nehemiah where giving daughters, in verse 25, and settling foreign women, in verse 23 and 27, were described as the same act, which was connected and compared to the sin of Solomon. Nevertheless, foreign women caused even him to sin. Yeah, this is in Nehemiah 13, 26. From the 13 references of foreign women, in seven cases, and you can see them here, the foreign women are mentioned together with the verb from the root yashav meaning to settle and inhabit them among the people. And we can compare it, of course, to Deuteronomy. The emphasis on the root yashav means that these women were brought to Judah and received a legal status and possession of the Judean lands and estate and houses. And, and so also their descendants and families. Only once, in Ezra 10, 44, the occasion, uh, the accusation made that the Judeans took wives from among the foreign women. The problem, however, is not the actual marriage. They had no problem of marriage foreign wife, but rather the fact that some of the Judeans had foreign wives by whom they had children. Here again, the problem is the legal status and possession of Judean real estates the houses and the lands. In the remaining three references, all of them in Ezra 10, where foreign wives were mentioned, there is a call to put away all the wives and their children, or to separate them from the congregation. From the context of all the other appearances of foreign women in this chapter, it is obvious that the reason to do so is to limit the damage of allowing the, uh, the, and legitimizing these uh, um, women and legal status and possession of the Judean houses and lands. Only in Nehemiah 13, verse 26, 
is there a direct accusation that people could uh, uh, be just like Solomon, who was married to foreign women and the foreign women caused him to sin? This is the only place where a theological accusation appears together with foreign women, and this is through the verb chata, to sin. The two literary units. Uh, in Ezra 10 and Nehemiah 13 are unique in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah as they are especially focused on ideological messaging and hold no other parallel or reflection in other parts of the book. And in light of the unique literary and ideological features in these units, my claim is that both of them are late addition to the book. In these two units, there is a focused use of foreign women, the expression, as a symbol and as an ideological marker for the right of the Judean population on the land and warning on the danger of bringing foreign women to Judah and awarding them rights uh, to property. The main question that I want to raise now is when such a claim could be raised, by whom? against who and why. The very focused argument against marriage to foreign women, which appears only in two short passages in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, and links marriage to foreign women to the problem of ownership of houses and lands, combines an existing reality in the Persian era Judah, where there were actually foreign women with a new claim not related to the theological dimension, but to land and property ownership. This claim didn't change much of the reality and ways of life among Judeans in Judah, in Babylon, or in Egypt, where evidence for in intermarriage, acculturation, uh, take my glasses, and social integration into the social, socio-economic environment is found. We may even assume that this claim expressed the position of a very small group, and I will try to locate this group, that went against the practice prevalent in the centuries before and in the same period. Even the extent of influence of this new ideology on the practice that prevailed in Judaism in the following decades, maybe even more than decades, is not really clear. But what is clear is that other opinions and voices continue to be present in Judah, as can be seen through the Book of Ruth, for example, a chronicles, the priestly law, large part of the biblical uh, historiography. And for example, in the Book of Ruth, and I think that it's even later than these claims in Israel and Nehemiah, a Moabite woman, which is the lowest available thing to be, and it, she's not only a, a, a Moabite woman, she's a widow, yeah? Is not only accepted into the Jewish community to marry for the second time a very prominent citizen in Bethlehem, but this woman becomes the ancestor of King David. So, so see the contra-polemic thing that we have is against the polemic that we have in Israel and Nehemiah. Regarding the book of Chronicles, the genealogies of Judah openly admit that the family in Judah has absorbed a number of foreigners uh, other than Ruth. For example, the daughter of Shua, the Canaanite, Yeter, the Ishmaelite, Yarcha, the Egyptian, Bithia, daughter of the Pharaoh, and several men married to, into Moabite. So when and why such a claim could be raised? I think that it connects to the reality in Jerusalem in the third, third century BC. On the one hand, Jerusalem was evidently small and materially poor throughout the, third, the of course, the Persian period, but also in the third century BCE, with settlement confined to the southeastern ridge, or what we call today the old city of David, no more than five hectares in area. So in this area, the maximum number of people that could live in Jerusalem is between 250 men or 200, 250 families, 1,000 people, no more. 
And I'm now a kind of maximalist because there are scholars who think that they were much less. During the third and early second century BC, a slow but constant increase in the general prosperity of the city can be noticed together with a change in the material culture indicating towards a more heterogenic and complex population. Some Jews were probably employed in the Ptolemaic military forces, which would have taken some pressure uh, of land distribution in Judah and perhaps provided a certain flow of cash back to Judah from Egypt. Besides, some elite families like the Tobias family, for example, brought new wealth, raising the general prosperity of Jerusalem. There were many more connections with the surrounding provinces and the new elite families in Jerusalem became an important part of the leadership of the city that until that time was ruled by the priestly families with no any competition, with a clear connection to the ideology of the Babylonian Gola, of the people living in Babylon. Now, how we can see it, I will give you just example of my study on it, because when we study well-dated material that was in Jerusalem, we can see that in most of the Persian period, the well-dated material is very confined to small parts in the city of David itself. And when we move a little bit forward to the late Persian period, we see a little bit more, but still very confined. And when we move to the third and especially to the second century, suddenly we see it much larger. So more people, more houses, more lands, everything is more in this transition to the third century and then to the second century. And then of course, we can see the date of it. We can see when it happened. This is for example, the Rhodian alphabet that give us a very good date. But then you can see, we see dates, we can see how it goes and it's well dated. The third century BC under the Ptolemaic was the time when the priesthood, which apparently controlled exten okay. a, a extensive estates owned by the temple in Jerusalem, but without private ownership of lands, priests didn't have lands, or should not have lands, could go out against some of the Jerusalem elite and warn against losing control of the lands. The late additions to the book of Ezra and Nehemiah attest to the uh, uh, polemics against these families whose economic, business, and family ties could have jeopardized the Jews' ownership of the land in Jerusalem. Personal uh, polemics against defined families was also part of the text of this period, and here too, the book of Ezra and Nehemiah was a central stage for this. The fact that the text the written scroll was the stage to which the polemics between elite families in Jerusalem drained, fits the understanding of this period of time about the importance of the scroll, the written word, in the identity of Judah and the Jews of this period. And so, for example, at the same time, a polemic accusation, at the same time with the foreign women, a polemic accusation was added to Nehemiah 7 and Ezra 2, blaming the priestly family of Hakots with marriage with the rich family of Barzillai the Gileadite. I'm talking about someone that according to the biblical text came with David when David came back from the Absalom revolt and got land in Jerusalem. So if he is not a Jew, who is a Jew in this time? But suddenly the first time and the only time someone in Nehemiah is blaming him that he is not a Jew, and since the family of Hakots was married to him, so they should be excluded from the priest family, not be any priest. And we know that Hakots family continue to be priests even in the Maccabean times. So it, it's a polemic claim. It's not a real fact. Um, so uh, uh, we can see it and I will not read it now because it's really boring. Yeah. Um, so also here, these verses were added the same thing as the uh, uh, polemics against uh, women uh, uh, in, in, were added. And this is also uh, uh, the same thing that in the early Ptolemaic period, uh, um, it's all happened. So this is a, really the stage for what we see as the later additional polemics that we see in Ezra and Nehemiah and also in different other parts of the Bible. Yeah.
Um, and again, we can see the polemics against the Akots, that they married the people from Barzilai, which they took from not Barzilai, a Giladi, a woman. So these are the people who shouldn't be any more priests in, in, in Jerusalem. Yeah, never mind. The importance of the written word and the scrolls caused the polemics and messages conveyed between the families in Jerusalem to be added into the texts and the messages were conveyed as additions within the historical descriptions. This is why contradictory polemical messages are present in the text alongside responses to these messages in a way that sometimes even undermines the coherence of the story. That makes problems to biblical scholars to understand what's going on in this story. I think that this will make sense. nice. An analysis of the text against, and this is my summary, against the background of the understanding of the historical reality can help in understanding these messages and in understanding the social and political reality in Jerusalem of the Persian and Hellenistic period, and also allow to return, return to the text with questions and clarifications about its writing process and stages of ed additions and edits. And I think that this is kind of uncovering who is behind it, who is doing the polemics. And also this is the case with the foreign wives. Thank you very much. Okay, there is a big problem, you know, of all the foreign wife stories in Ezra Nehemiah, because like, you know, this may be one of the proof that uh, these uh, stories are about Judeans, because at the end, what they do is establish committee. And the end of the story is to create a committee. And at the end, the committee, even, you know, in one case, they have a kind of a report, but in some other cases, not even report. So a committee is, is this. Um, I, I think that you are right. The original story in Ezra 9 is about purity and you cannot see any, any uh, reflection of foreign wives and the end in Ezra 10 is, uh, is uh, adding the, this dimension of uh, foreign women and also this story is not end. And this is of course connected to the Ezra story that is in Nehemiah and the combination of adding it. For many years I worked about uh, um, the commentary on Ezra and Nehemiah for Hermeniah with my late good friend, Gary Knoppers. So we are dealing with these, the combination, but you know, this is a very, you know, complicated uh, literary uh, dealing with Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, and we, we should know that this story went over a few stages of editing and it's not completed. And of course the late additions are giving some new dimension for the text, but don't expect to find ending of stories because in Israel Nehemiah you have clear beginnings but you have no endings. Yeah. So uh, of course in the in the pa written paper I have much more on this thing but the the fact is that in all the cases when they are dealing with foreign women in these two texts they don't deal about marriage they talk about to settle. And to settle it means that people are getting this uh, uh, rights and not the women, but this, the, 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 no, the yes. children, the kids. And with it, we know it very clearly that all kinds of Jewish laws about the property laws, you know, where it goes when the father is, is not anymore. So the kids are getting, and if the kids are the sons of a foreign wife with a family in Ashdod, for example, this is the problem they're trying to, to uh, speak about. Now, what I'm saying is that the Ashdodites, and of course the Ashdodites are a symbol in Israel Nehemiah, they speak Ashdodite, they don't know to, to speak, you know, Judahite, you know, language. So these are the symbol of the influence. For the, this is going to the uh, province to the west of Judah. You know, I'm digging for many years now in Azekah. Azekah is the border between Judah and, you know, the Ashdodites, the, 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 the province to the west. And it's amazing to see how much zakah in the material culture is Jerusalem. 99% of the material culture of the Persian early Hellenistic period that we have in Azeka is going to the hill. So it's very close. It's very a, a homogeneous society, very small. 30,000 people in all of the province. 
When we go one or two kilometers to the south of Azeka, we are in Idomea. This is a totally different material culture, people, uh, not the same jars, not the same culture, not the same diet. We go a few kilometers to the west, we are in Ashdod, we are in the coast. Totally different culture, totally different. So what they're trying to say is to protect this homogeneous, this close, very protective uh, province that we can see how it developed from the sixth to the fifth to the four, the change is coming in the Ptolemaic period. And uh, I think that this is part of the attempt to keep this um, porcupine, you know, this is the, the, how I, I, I imagine this, you know, porcupine, uh, they're trying to have needles all over just to keep the heart, you know, a, a, as they can. The amazing thing is what's, what, what's going on only 100 years later in the Hasmonean period, when this porcupine is going out, throwing needles all over, conquering lands, uh, uh, making big tribes in Idomea and in the Galilee, making them Jews, forcing them to become Jews, and suddenly everything changed. And I think that the beginning of the change is in the Ptolemaic period with a try attempt of a certain group. I think some of the priests in Jerusalem to keep the homogeneous close society as against other voices that we have around and um, and very soon they lose. They cannot really stand against this influence who are coming. The amazing thing if we're talking about history is, is, is amazing because these closed, you know, people are trying to keep the Judaism. Now, I'm, maybe I will make Daniel nervous. These uh, people in Jerusalem who are trying to keep the, you know, the closed society are the Hellenistic time, people who are becoming more and more influenced by the Greek culture. And the people who are living around, for example, in the Maccabim area, in Modi'in area, who are trying to push some new ideas, will become the Maccabees of the second century, and they will come to save Jerusalem from you know, the leaders of yesterday. So things are always moving. And what we have in Israel and Nehemiah is a kind of frozen pictures of a certain period of polemic, of a beginning of a pol- kind of polemic between different groups. And I think this is a, really a beginning of something that will end when Daniel will come to his period. So this is the connection between the, the beginning and the, the, the end of this story. Judah Heights, yeah. I think that Gerim is a very late invention, not before the return of, you know, second or third wave of people coming back from Babylon. Of course, we have some uh, uh, earlier... Uh, roots for this inside Judah, if it will be, you know, the origin of Levites, which is priests from around, you know, not from Jerusalem, but from other temples who were not functioning anymore, came to Jerusalem. Of course, the, the idea of Gerim is not, is not uh, unique for, um, uh, only for Judah. We have all time people who are, but again, I, I, I just finished to write some papers on the subject. And I think that even the stories about the Exodus, are reflecting the uh, reality of the Persian period when people came back, came, when people came from Babylon, trying to establish their holds on the land. Not all the people who came from uh, Babylon are originally, uh, or can prove that they are originally Judahites, and there, there, there is a problem who is yes, who can prove it and who is not. So all the question about Judahites, all the genealogies, or the Gerim question, all of it began, I think, in this time, including the rules, the laws that are uh, supposed to teach us how to deal with these exceptional groups. No, I think that no one asked uh, the question who is foreign woman, who is not, before it started to be a political agenda of a group against the attempt to, to, to start asking this question. So I think that uh, um, you had this uh, family of Barzillai the Gileadite, which is a nice story in the book of Samuel. And then you have, he didn't come Barzillai because he was a very old person. So he sent his uh, uh, son, Kim Ham. And we have a place near Jerusalem. I think this is the Rephaim Valley near Jerusalem with a place named Gerut Kim Ham. Gerut Kim Ham. So the foreign 
maybe Kim Ham. This is his land. And suddenly in the Persian period, the daughter of this family, which are related to Barzillai the Gilad, is married the priestly, uh, uh, the son of a priestly family, Hakots, in Jerusalem. So I think that it happened all the time because they were in the same kindergarten, the same school, the same playground, they knew each other. And someone who has a, a kind of a state in Refaim can, can go to Jerusalem one hour, you live there, walking for half an hour, he's in Jerusalem. Maybe his house is in Jerusalem and only his estate is outside. So they knew each other. The question is not if it's something that happened. The question is when someone has the interest to say, okay, this is not okay. So uh, stop doing it. Or he wants from different reason to have something against the family and he's accusing them in something that yesterday it was not anything to accuse them. So uh, again, you know, we live in Israel. Everything is political. Who is going with, uh, with the, the, uh, with the, in the government and who is not? Who, is, who tried to go with them and who didn't succeed? So now he's blaming them that they are going. So everything is, again, at, at the end, blaming historiography, polemic thing. It's not a reality. I totally agree with you. Totally agree. I think that the, this is why the, the, the kind of fight between the Zerah Kodesh, the Holy Seed, and the people who remain in the land is an early Persian period fight. You know, very soon, it, the, this fight, uh, you know, uh, the, the Zerah Kodesh won. So everybody in, in Ezra 2, Nehemiah 7, everybody is Zerah Kodesh. Everybody is coming from, from uh, about everybody is connected to the people who came from Babylon, even if they were not in, I don't know, Altalena or any other place. So everyone wants to, to, to be part of this. And then uh, later on, there is a beginning of a different polemics between different circles. I agree. Thank you.